Now listen to me carefully, you fat tub of goo. Oh my God, there she is. There's Rosemary. Where? Right there. Right where? Straight ahead, across the field. Is she behind the rhino? At that same table, there was a, a quite large woman. And I was wondering, what if this guy, instead of confronting the smoker, had said to the large woman, what's the matter with you, you fat pig? Don't you know how dangerous it is to be so overweight? Stop eating, for God's sake. And don't you dare get dessert. And what's the matter with right? I wouldn't be enjoying my life had I not gone to that Jenny Craig Center five years ago. If one uh, overindulges in food, uh, it has a negative effect upon one's whole personality and one's, one's moral being. That was a good night, except I felt fat. Don't be ridiculous. It's true. Nowadays, the only clothes I can get into were once owned by Pavarotti. I just want to take a pill and wake up in the morning. Thin. I don't care if it knocks 10 years off my life or shrinks my brain, as long as it shrinks my belly and all. <laughs> Any sack for money. What she needs is her own zip code. <laughs> Jersey's a small state. She moves in. She could tip it over. <laughs> <laughs> I like a woman you can grab onto something. You grab onto Ginny Sacramoni, your fucking hands will disappear. She's so fat, her blood type is ragu. <laughs> She's so fat she goes camping. The bears have to hide their food. But Ginny holds ass. She's gotta make two trips. <laughs> I'm not going to have sex with any man. No man will want me when I look like this. I don't want to have fat sex. Fat sex is ass. I was babysitting this four-year-old, um, and he told me that he didn't want to eat a chocolate chip cookie because, you know, his mom said he was going to get too big or he was going to get, you know, people were going to make fun of him. And it just it shocked me to think that a kid at four turning five is already thinking about his size, like, come on. Dangerous practices are considered more acceptable than being overweight, or, you know, overweight, quotation marks around there. Um, the idea that it's better for someone who is heavier to starve themselves than it is to be healthy. It's taken me a very long time to become comfortable with it, that's for sure. Um, I was always chubby when I was younger. So I never felt like I fit in with everyone else. An example of anti-fat prejudice that I've witnessed in my family is being told that I'm fat or I've overheard other relatives say to my um, siblings or to my cousins, oh, it looks like you've gained weight since I last saw you at Thanksgiving, or a comment along those lines. Um, dieting and then binging, then purging, took away a lot of time because instead of actually enjoying a meal with my family, I'm thinking, how do I get away from them so I can get this out of my body? You know, and I've been called overweight and it was, you know, I questioned it myself as, well, overweight compared to what? Overweight compared to who? Like, you know, whose standards are these? My name is Lisa Tillman. At Rollins College, I teach a course called The Political Economy of Body and Food. My student collaborators and I cover a lot of ground, from eating disorders and steroid abuse to food insecurity and farm worker justice. When I asked the collaborators featured in this film on what topic they wanted to center our work, they overwhelmingly chose cultural narratives of weight, fat, and obesity. In other words, what stories circulate in our culture about fat, and how do those stories impact our bodies, lives, relationships, and public policy?
Baseball pitchers. Jolly. Abby. Funny. Funny. Oh my God! <laughs> Not like as healthy. Unhealthy. Unhealthy. Gross. 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 Lazy. Lazy. Useless. Sad. Sad. I can't stop eating. I eat because I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy because I eat. Something that I never want to become. For myself, I mean, it would really be You know, just feeling unwanted, kind of, or feeling picked on, or just feeling uh, singled out, you know. In general, people tend to think that that, or with quotes around it, are for comic relief, they don't think of them as people who can be taken seriously. What's gone wrong this week, huh? We've had visitors. What did you do, eat them? Have you lost some weight? I have, and thank you for noticing. I thought so. When you were bent over tying your shoes, your wallet didn't look like it was trying to bust out of your ass. <laughs> do you uh, always check out my behind when I'm bent over? Well, I try to look every other way, but that thing is an IMAX. <laughs> They can't stop eating, that's all they think about. Well, I, I think the most popular, of course, would be, um, you know, when, when someone's depressed, very sad, um, you can get the image of a larger person going to buy a big tub of ice cream and just, you know, sitting in bed, basking and eating ice cream. <laughs> to make fun of you? <laughs> Why do we do this to ourselves? Every time we get depressed, we eat and eat and eat. They always say fat people are, smell. They have no friends. They probably are unloved. I think we assume that it's going to be difficult to be friends with this person, almost, because of the bias that surrounds it. They're out of shape. They can't exercise. They can't really move. They're fat because it's a life choice. They assume that I'm unhealthy, that I'm lazy, that uh, I'm physically, you know, not not fast or not able to do things that, that people that are thinner. That, that they can do. From where do these gut level associations and stereotypes come? The answer, from every social institution, beginning with our families. The degree to which our parents and siblings have internalized our culture's fear and hatred of fat has a lasting influence on our own relationships to body, weight, and fat. My family has been really good about just teaching me, you know, to eat healthy. It's more about being healthy than being any sort of weight. Fat was never really something that was criticized in our family. Um, we watch a lot of TV and, you know, usually we don't really hold back when we're talking about the folks that we see. Um, but we've never really at least my parents have never really sat down and really called someone out on who they've seen for being fat as like a, a character trait. This quote, I forget which book or reading it was, but the girl was saying that she was talking to her mom and her mom said, hey, you better not eat that way or you'll look like me and just ended the topic like that. Well, my mom actually says that all the time. I've, I've told her many times, I said, hey, I know that you're not, like happy with your body size, you're not happy with your image, why don't you just come with me to the gym, you know, I'll show you around, I'll show you what I do. And she doesn't want to go because she's afraid that people will look at her at the gym, look at her differently, and she's told that to me, and it's, it's kind of hard hearing that from her mom. My sister has been um, overweight since she was little, and recently, you know, she's been diagnosed for ADD, so she's been getting Ritalin patches on her hip, so it's been making her weight fluctuate in pretty extreme ways. And so, you know, she will talk about different medications in 
how they impact her weight versus how they impact her ADD. And that always really concerns me. I went to go visit my grandmother this weekend and she has, she has, um, she doesn't have Alzheimer's, but she forgets a lot of things. And so she's seen me recently. She's seen me since I've lost weight. But when I got there, she was in, she's in a rehabilitation hospital, so she's not doing that well. But she like looked at my mother and whispered, and she didn't not thinking that I could hear her. And she's like, Julie, Julie, she's half the size, half. And my parents were like, just ignore her. Like she doesn't know what she's talking about. But that still like hit me hard. Like well, the main person that that's really like picked on me a lot is my brother, my older brother. He really says a lot about it and. You know, just kind of just saying, oh, you know, you're fat or you need to lose weight, you know. And, and the, the bad thing about it is that, you know, like some of those things have like, like rubbed off onto his children and they've actually said things. Whenever I Skype my mom, um, she would see me and she would say, oh, my God, you look like a Mexican. You're dark. You're fat. And whenever I did eat, I just felt disgusted with myself. I could feel the calories like... You know, like if I, if I ate a french fry, I could feel it going down my thighs and I'm like, that's disgusting. And I would make myself throw up, even if it's one fry and not eating anything for the rest of the day. And I would like drink gallons and gallons of freezing cold water and sh be shivering in the summer heat just because I was, my body was craving that energy. And um, my mom actually has like, she didn't walk in on me, but she's been skeptical and she suspected that I was doing something because my weight dropped so fast. And um, so she said, you, so she just like made a general assumption. She said, if you are throwing up, I will take down your door. But I still found ways around it. And so my weight kept dropping until I was like 98 pounds. And my mom was really alarmed because she's like, she didn't want to say anything. And then like when people did comment, like in church and people would comment and say like, oh, you look really good, how'd you do it? And my mom was like, oh yeah, she just works out. Because she, did, she, like, she doesn't want a fat daughter. Like she wants me to be that per perfect little girl that she sees me as. But she knows what I am doing. But it got so bad that I was hospitalized um, with an IV because I wasn't, my body wasn't getting enough nutrients. And um, my mom and the doctors told me that I had to stop or my esophagus would erode and I would have to be eat, eating through like a feeding tube. So, um... The fear and hatred of fat that circulates within many of our families gets reflected and reinforced in other social contexts. Another important source of discourse about weight and fat is our peers, our friends, both in and outside the school environment. In high school, when I was diagnosed with a lung disease, I had to go on the he a heavy dose of prednisone. It has terrible side effects, including weight gain and depression. It's a different look when you're on steroids when you gain the weight, but people don't know. So I remember um, someone who I had been friends with and then we weren't friends anymore, but she said to one of my friends how she noticed that I was gaining so much weight and that like killed me because people just don't know. Um, and I remember my second day of school, um, there's this one boy in my class who spent the entire day calling me um, jelly butt and kept saying I had thunder thighs. And before that, I hadn't really cared too much. Um, but after that, I suddenly stopped wearing shorts to school and my mother commented on it. Um, and, you know, she talked to me. She thought it was sorted out. But, you know, for years after that, I just never wore shorts. I wore long skirts, I wore pants, but for years I just could not bring myself to wear shorts. And looking at other kids, I never thought they were fat, but it had such an impact on me. Um, and to this day, it just really never occurs to me really to wear shorts. You know, it's been kind of like a, ever since, you know, I was 15, it's been like up and down, you know, going up and down in weight. I went through a height growth spurt, and then uh, like pretty soon, like I started going through like a weight growth spurt, and I put on like, 
I'd say like 50 pounds in like three months. And you know, and like to myself, I really didn't notice it, you know, but I started like hearing people talk about it. And they were, they would just kind of like a, like mention like, oh, are you gaining weight or you don't, you know, like you, and some people would just plainly would say, oh, you're getting fat. It really affected my self-esteem. I was like, oh, I'm gonna lose weight. I didn't know what to do. And I wasn't really like a, like an athletic person or somebody that did like weight training. So I went into basically like a, a mode where I was just like really trying to avoid eating. And it got to a point where I was eating like one meal every two days. I ended up like uh, getting really like weak. And uh, you know, like I wasn't like a, somebody that lifted weights a lot, but when I tried, I tried to get into lifting weights that, you know, when I was down to 190, and, and I noticed like I noticed how like my energy was just like like shot, you know, and I couldn't I wasn't able to I just wasn't able to to really do anything like active like that. So then, you know, I started eating again and you know, and you know, I kinda of put on some more weight and everything but I mean my most painful it would have to be like trying to lose it, you know, like feeling the pressure that other people put on me that it made me unhappy with myself, you know, and then like, you know, pretty much just abusing my body to lose the weight to, you know, to try to make these other people happy, you know, and I went through, I, I did some bad things, you know, just, you know, pretty much starving myself. I was, uh, in society's terms, an obese child. When I went to school, I was constantly ridiculed, left and right about being obese, and so was my brother. We just went straight to school, got off the bus to walk straight home without just hearing them talk about us, but we just walked as fast as we could, got inside. Uh, I think the worst experience might have been when I was getting off the bus. My brother was still, on, still on, at school because we were in the drama program, but I didn't feel good. So I went home early. I went home at the regular time. And the guy, since I didn't have anybody I sit with, I sat in the back by myself. And one of them decided to sit next to me. And he made fun of me the whole ride back, kept poking at me. And he was, he was very, very rude to me. Um, I got off the bus as soon, as soon as possible. They actually followed me home. And they kept threatening to, to jump me just for being overweight. And then they started throwing rocks at me. And I just kept my cool. I went inside because there's no way you can win a battle against like 12 people. So I went inside and I just ended my day there. I think I just went to sleep, stayed in my bed for the rest of the night. Around seventh grade, we both decided to join the football team. We actually lost a lot more weight than we expected to. We, um, we, started, we started hanging out with the guys because we started winning and so they started liking us. And when, while we were hanging out with them, we saw people who, we saw people who were your stereotypical, like it's not stereotypical, but your the way the society defines it, overweight. And so we saw them and they would make fun of them and we weren't gonna just stand there. So we made fun of them also. In the hindsight, we, we look back and we're like, man, we were pretty we were pretty bad because for us to have gone through that for three years, to go through that for three years and then just all of a sudden just forget about it and do the same things to other kids is just, it's, it's not right. As we have heard and seen stereotypes, prejudices, and pressures about body shape, size, weight, and fat circulate in our homes, with our peers, and in our primary and secondary schools. To what extent do we grow out of these stereotypes and prejudices? And to what extent do we carry them with us into adulthood and onto college campuses? I felt very accepted since I started school here, so I've never had a problem and or any of my friends who would be considered overweight. Oh, we're terrible. We're a very superficial campus. I think that every day, if if you don't look 
your absolute best, you're going to get talked about. But I think you can also find groups of people that, you know, are in gender studies, are in CMC, um, I work at the radio, that kind of have this like independent and alternative view of society. You know, you have to look like the, the girls in the magazines and you have to have the nice clothes and you have to be at zero. Sometimes when I go to the gym and you see uh, the girls working out, uh, there's this girl that was like probably 100 pounds and she's, she's talking with her friend like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna lose all my flab on my arm. And I'm like, oh my God. At home, like no one in my family owns a scale. We've never had one my whole life. And then I came here and they're in every room. You know, just the image here is very, you know, trendy and very fashionable. And, and really, you know, being fat isn't trendy or fashionable. I was with a, um, with a few boys and a woman walked past and they made a comment about her um, cottage cheese and they're like, that is the most disgusting thing that I've ever seen. And I was just like, oh God. Well, a friend of mine actually, she recently told me how she was at the campus center and um, there was a group of guys sitting around a table and um, when she was walking by, they were all like, hey, check out that girl. And then one of the boys um, called out to her, oh, she looks like a cow. And so um, she came back to the house and told us all, and she was actually crying because of how it made her feel. And you'd think once you get to college, maybe some of this ridiculous conversation might start to go away, but no. I mean, in a lot of ways, we're still kids. And, and more than that, if society is supporting this message, why would it change just because you go to college? I probably don't go a half hour with thinking about how I look, because especially I think this campus is really bad and it makes you always think about how you're portraying yourself, how you look that day. Everyone talks about how they have their fat days and so um, it's, I guess it's impacted me a lot. And when I came in here I've heard of stuff like pre-workout, which is just caffeinated drinks, just getting ready for the gym. Uh, protein, which is after workout and you get bigger size. And I, this was all introduced to me as a freshman and I knew nothing about it and I just started beginning, taking it up, getting bigger, getting stronger, and I loved it. Can I only imagine if I did take steroids and so on, if it was just there, I can only imagine how much I would have taken I probably would have been just this huge meathead that I would hate today, so. I think the men are almost worse because, you know, you always see them at the gym, you know, pumping iron, and they don't want to get fat. And then also, I don't think they, they think to date people who are overweight. And so there's that prejudice from men against women. Difficult question. <laughs> I don't know. I've never really put any consideration into that. Um, that's a hard question. Probably not a good question for me just because I don't date, so. <laughs> I, I don't really think size really has much to do with relationship. I think it's the chemistry or the just the amount of stuff that you have in common. Um, probably not. I don't know. That's just. I know I've. My ideal guy, one of the top things is a nice body. This is actually the opposite. There's a girl who was very, very attractive in ninth grade. And this was the first day of school that I saw her. So the next day I told my, well that day I told my friend. And by that Wednesday we were going out. Unfortunately by that Friday we actually had broken up because she was the meanest girl I've ever met in my life. I mean I wouldn't say like, no, you know. I think it would definitely be situational, um, but I think a lot of times uh, body image definitely like plays a role in attractiveness. Having been through the experience myself of you know not being you know skinny or how you're supposed to, supposed to look, um, I think I would give that person a chance just because people don't need to be judged on their body size. If we had the same likes, and we had a lot of things in common then I don't see why not.
I think that I could see myself and like dating someone who is not considered culturally fit, but I don't think that in middle school or high school or even the beginning of college, I ever would have felt like that. My friend, a girlfriend who's um, a little bit overweight, but she has the best personality. If I found a guy like that, I would not be opposed. <laughs> if that person is a kind person, then I don't think that his weight should matter. In relation to like, you know, the, the norms or whatever, the, you know, the cultural standards, like uh, I'm definitely more, you know, like just open-minded. You know, I really, you know, ultimately it's, it's really about the person, you know, and, and the, the looks just, you know, it's really secondary, but at the same time, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not greater than other people. I mean, it, it affects my, my, my judgment as well. But I don't, I don't, I don't like victimize people for it, and I don't, I don't hurt th their feelings about it. The ways we come to think and feel about our own bodies and others' bodies are shaped by another powerful source, the mass media. Each of us in the U.S. is exposed to approximately 5,000 commercial messages every day. And on average, a child interfaces with media 8 to 13 hours a day. Such exposure provides us with information about body, shape, size, weight, and fat, as well as misinformation, stereotypes, and prejudices. All right, everyone, I'd like to get started. I, 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 I'd like to get what we're stuck. I think that you know, you know what, prior to taking this course, I wasn't as critical of television shows um, and other forms of media that I watched. Um, at first, I think I would have thought that that was something funny and laughed at that. But in retrospect, it's not funny to be making fun of people because of their weight. You see it a lot in the news whenever they talk about obesity, and you know they call it the obesity epidemic. Um, these endless montages of headless fat people. It's just them from the neck down. It's focusing on their weight, not them as people. And I think they use the excuse that they're trying to protect people's identities. But when they, every other stock image they use in the news, you know, it's the whole person. So what is it about fat people where it's just so? disgusting, I guess, that they can't even show people's heads. The whole Dove campaign is supposed to be about be beautiful at any size, but in reality they use a larger woman and then they're saying be beautiful, but we're going to use your picture to sell firming cream. So it's going against everything that they have their campaign for. So would, would Jesus bother with whether you're fat or not? Well, I think Jesus would want us to, you know, to, the two, two basic things in the Bible were to eat less and exercise more. And when I saw it, I was like, wow, to think that someone could go this far, to insult people publicly and in front of others under the guise of religion. Republicans were trying to push for Chris Christie to run for president. It was all over the, like, CNN, Fox News saying he shouldn't run just because he doesn't have the look, meaning that he's too fat. No one wants a president who smells like bacon after he runs up the steps. Well, you don't know what he smells like. No, I'm, not, I'm just saying no one wants someone okay. who sweats, I mean, no one wants someone who looks unhealthy. I think you should be judged based on what you're trying to do for the country rather than how you look. I mean, we've, we've made a lot of headway in like, you know, racial issues, you know, and if you see how, really how, just how ignorant it is to judge people based on their color of their skin, it's the same thing, judging them based on their weight. When it comes to fat, our culture is in a full-blown panic. According to the dominant narrative, fatness or obesity is a public health crisis, an epidemic. 
We asked Nightline's John Donvan to sift through all the reporting we've done on the problem over the past year to try to find the real villain behind the obesity epidemic. Who's to blame for the United States' obesity epidemic? One day at a press conference, uh, so frustrated because everybody wanted to talk about anthrax and terrorism, and a reporter inadvertently in a room this size filled with reporters said to me, well, Surgeon General, what is the most challenging problem you're facing? Of course, this is after 9-11 and anthrax. I said, obesity, dead silence. Nobody knew what to ask me. And they said, why? I said, because it's the terror within. In 2013, the American Medical Association voted to classify obesity as a disease. A disease is an abnormal condition or incorrectly functioning system. How can obesity be an abnormal condition when one-third of Americans are classified as obese and another one-third as overweight? Body fat is not the result of incorrect functioning. Fat results from a natural protective mechanism that evolved to help humans survive food scarcity. Our culture's valorization of thinness in women and lean muscularity in men is historically and culturally specific. At times and in cultures in which food is scarce, fat is a sign of health and prosperity. At times and in cultures in which food is abundant, thinness and lean muscularity get linked with health and class. Dr. Eric Oliver of the University of Chicago points out that U.S. cultural ideals of the female body often run counter to women's struggles for legal and social equality. In the late 19th century, as advocates for women's rights fought for suffrage and access to education and employment, consumer culture gave us the Gibson girl, linking attractiveness and class to a small, corseted waist. In 1920, women secured the right to vote as the cultural ideal for the female body shrunk further. The 1950s beauty ideal became more full-figured, coinciding with a renewed valorization of domesticity for white, middle, and upper-class women. In the 60s and 70s, U.S. women took up more space legally, professionally, and educationally while the cultural ideal for the female body took up less space. Today, the cultural ideal for the male body has become as unattainable as that for the female body. From the perspective of consumer culture, this makes sense. If men can be convinced to see their bodies as deficient, as not measuring up, as problems, then men can be convinced to purchase alleged solutions. Cultural ideals link particular body types to attractiveness, to personality traits like discipline and self-control, and to health itself. These culturally produced linkages come to seem natural, normal, like common sense. Most of us assume without question that being fat is inherently unhealthy, that losing weight will improve health, and that there are effective and safe means of losing weight and keeping it off. In comprehensive reviews of medical literature, Dr. Eric Oliver, a professor of political science, Paul Campos, a professor of law, and Dr. Glenn A. Gaser, director of the Healthy Lifestyles Research Center, at Arizona State University conclude that it is more dangerous to be underweight than overweight. In several large-scale studies, the lowest mortality rates were found among those classified as overweight. Being over the medical and cultural classifications for ideal or normal weight can have a protective function when fighting a serious illness like cancer. Body mass index, BMI alone, cannot tell us what or how much a person eats, 
how much she exercises or how healthy she is. As Marilyn Wan suggests, when we look at a fat person, the only thing that we can diagnose with any certainty is our own level of stereotype and prejudice toward fat people. There are meaningful measures of health, the nutritional quality of a person's diet, level of physical activity, blood pressure, and blood sugar. Independent of such measures, the alleged dangers of being overweight or obese have not been established. What have been established are the dangers of diet pills, weight loss surgery, disordered eating practices, weight cycling, losing, then regaining weight, the typical pattern for a dieter. So what actually improves health? Eating a nutrient-dense diet and engaging in regular physical activity, regardless of impact on BMI. On the effectiveness side, the failure rate of sustained weight loss is 90 to 95 percent. On the safety side, in the words of Paul Campos, far more Americans do serious damage to their health by attempting to lose weight than by gaining it. Damage is seen across the weight spectrum. Anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality rate of any psychological disorder, and as many as 1 in 50 persons undergoing bariatric surgery will die within one month of the procedure. Our cultural narratives of obesity serve the 50 to $60 billion per year diet industrial complex far more than they improve the health of those labeled overweight or obese. According to a review by health educator Pat Lyons, the same obesity experts who are on the faculty of medical institutions and review research for publication in medical journals also obtain millions in government grants, work as paid consultants for diet and drug companies, and run weight loss clinics. The war on fat, says Paul Campos, which is supposedly about making all of us healthy, is really about making some of us rich. The central problem, therefore, is not obesity, but obesity profiteering, weight-based prejudice and discrimination. What can we do? Recognize that you have a stake in ending anti-fat prejudice, regardless of your current body shape or size. Exposure to cultural ideals for body shape and size lowers everyone's self-esteem, undermines our relationships with others, and drains energy and time from civic and community engagement. Eat a nutrient-dense diet and engage in regular physical activity for their own sake, not for weight loss. Vote with your wallet. Support companies and organizations that promote health for everyone, regardless of shape or size and withhold support from companies and organizations that sell their products and services via anti-fat prejudice. Support anti-bullying policies inclusive of body shape and size and interrupt harassment and bullying on these bases. Those classified as overweight and obese are more likely to be bullied than their so-called normal weight peers 
and people who have been bullied consider, attempt, and commit suicide at higher rates than those who have not. Support anti-discrimination protections based on body shape and size. In the overwhelming majority of organizations, municipalities, and states, a person can be refused service in a shop or restaurant, denied a hotel room, house, or apartment, and even fired on no other basis than body shape and size. Support public policies that facilitate everyone's access to nutrient-dense food and to safe environments conducive to activity and play. Such policies include a living wage and nutrition support programs such as WIC and food stamps. Seek out sources of information independent of the diet industrial complex. Powerful forces wage the war on obesity and they have a lot to lose if we decide to pursue peace instead of war with our bodies. My collaborators and I stand on the side of peace, health, equity, and justice. Learn more for yourself, then decide where you stand. The biggest reason I feel that you know you need to care about anti-fat prejudice is because it's everywhere, it's literally everywhere and it's not something that we're taught as children to acknowledge or even you know think about. You know we, we see it as a form of bias but we don't even acknowledge it as a bad form of bias. I definitely feel like I've, I've grown a different view of things. Um, I'm definitely urging friends to, to not laugh at anti-fat prejudice. Get over it, get past that. We're not children, we're adults, and we should be setting examples for younger people. People gotta grow up. People have to, to just know that, you know, there's, there's different kinds of people out there in every, in every respect you can imagine. And, and the more accepting we are, and the more uh, wide variety we have in people, it really makes us better people. I think in general we use being fat as a scapegoat for a lot of things in society. Um, if you say that you're unhealthy because you're fat, you can ignore any systematic problems that are involving, you know, access to health care or, you know, the time people have in their day. Um, if you say you're fat because you don't eat well, you can make that a personal choice and not a problem of, you know, who has access to the food that means eating well. Um, if you say you're fat because you're lazy, um, what does that mean as a society that we're cutting off all these people who might have so much to give but we're writing them off as lazy because of what they look like and not because of what their actual character is. Um, I think it's doing, even if you're not what's considered fat, you're really doing yourself a disservice by alienating, really, so many people who are part of society who could contribute so much.